Support for the Pitch Talks podcast provided by the good beer folks at Steam Whistle, makers of Canada's premium Pilsner. Stop by the brewery before or after the game for a sample or a six-pack. Hey everybody, it's time for Pitch Talks. Welcome to the Pitch Talks podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Hilliard. This week, it's all Alex Anthopoulos all the time. That's right, a whole episode dedicated to the former Blue Jays GM. We'll hear from our Pitch Talks panel on why they think Alex left a reported five-year, $10 million contract on the table, and we'll hear from the man himself recorded live in Hamilton, Ontario. All that and more coming up on Pitch Talks. Time for the pitch plug. Homestandsports.com. That's where you can find everything Pitch Talks. Info about live show dates, tickets, merch, blogs, etc., etc. That's all at homestandsports.com. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can always email us at info at homestandsports.com and we're Pitch Talks on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Oh yeah, one last thing. If you dig hockey as much as you dig baseball, check out our brother website, PuckTalksLive.com. The same great content, different great sport. PuckTalksLive.com. Woo! All right, so, (laughs) baseball fans, in case you've had your head in the sand... Alex Anthopoulos, architect of the 2015 ALDS champs, Toronto Blue Jays, is no longer with the club. Hmm. So today we're going to hear from ESPN's Jonah Carey, along with Sportsnet's Stephen Brunt, Arden Zwelling, Sid Sixero, and Jamie Campbell, all recorded live at Pitch Talks, on why Alex is gone. Then we'll hear from Alex himself on being a fan, his dream job, the pressures of being the boss, and why manager John Gibbons is always on him about his ride. Now, just remember, to give you some context, our Anthopolis show was recorded live in Hamilton on the same day that Alex met with incoming Jays president Mark Shapiro for the first time. But let's start things off with one fan's AA takeaway post-breakup. The one thing that just comes back to me is why and how two smart baseball guys just go separate ways and then you know it's so many emotions going through didn't Thopolis you know leave us like leave us at the altar didn't was it Thopolis' fault was it his fault or was it Shapiro's Ed Rogers so the question is just how did this happen where we were so happy you know six outs away from the world do series. you want a hug I remember sure. that. <laughs> the idea that people are so obsessed and like Oh, the general manager left. That's a big deal. I don't know if you go if you go to another city and the cleanup hitter leaves. That's a big deal. I get it. I get why people were upset. Um, but ultimately, you know, if they can fill the pitching staff one way or another, they'll be a good team next year. It was pretty clear that Mark Shapiro um, was going to have a very strong hand in running the baseball team. It's not now. He's not at the GM meetings. You know, Tony LaCava's there. He's not going to micromanage it. I don't think. But he's a baseball guy. So I think Alex knew it was going to be different. I think he sensed he wasn't going to be comfortable in that environment. I think a lot of us who were around the team kind of got the sense during that playoff drive that he was going to leave. Like, I know I really, I really, re- I really got the sense oh. in Kansas City. And so there was a moment kind of like after, uh, after I guess it was game six against Kansas City, and Kansas City won, I'm down in the clubhouse, and we kicked around there for like more than an hour just, you know, waiting for guys to talk, and you know, obviously everyone's distraught. I walked into Gibby's office, and, and John Gibbons is there with Tony Lacavo was in there, Perry Benassian, uh, you know, director of pro scouting, uh, Alex Nathopoulos was in there, and Alex is very reflective, and he's very much huh. like talking about the past and looking, I mean, he's always, what's next, right? Yeah, Going yeah, forward, yeah. what am I doing next? What are we doing tomorrow? Like I was, you know, I half expected him after the final pitch of game six to be like, th- you know, looking at options and things like that, right? But no, he was like being very reflective and that's when I was kind of like, oh, you really are leaving. And I think a lot of us who had had, you know, off the record conversations with him uh, during the playoffs kind of realized like, oh, this isn't a sure thing. Like he's, there's very much a chance that he's not coming back, but I don't think fans got that sense 
Right. I think they kind of thought that, like, all right, Alex has finally done it. He's the first, you know, many men have tried to get this franchise to the postseason, and Alex has done it, and now he's going to be with us forever, and everything's going to be great. It didn't work like that. The one thing no one associated with Alex was ego. And as a guy who wasn't in the room, hearing the conversations between those two guys, you cannot convince me that Alex Anthopoulos, after getting the franchise to the playoffs for the first time in 22 years, after pulling off what Sports Illustrated called the greatest trade deadline of all time by any GM, after having fans in Baltimore cheer his damn name as they clinched, after watching the DS, after watching all of that and what it caused for everyone out here and the TV numbers and the money it made, you can't tell me that guy didn't look across the table at Mark Shapiro and say, I can do my job very well, best of luck to you. I'm proud of him for what he's, he's done uh, for this franchise, but let's not forget in June, you know, in early parts of July, uh, if we had arrived at this decision at that time, I'm not sure many of people would have been as up in arms as they are about it now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Pitch Talks in Hamilton. I would like to introduce to you the general manager and other things of the Toronto Blue Jays, Mr. Alex Anthopoulos. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, being back in the city is awesome for me. I just last time I'm on a stage with a beer in my hand, I met the John. If anyone remembers <laughs> yeah, that, tell, pub, well, tell your hand. Like, right. This is cool. I get to wear <laughs> jeans, and then he's like, "You could bring a beer on stage." I'm like, "Wow!" wow. And then just yeah. <laughs> here, and like, I'm like everyone else in here. Like, if I wasn't doing this, I would be here. So, fire away. You know what I want to ask you? I was thinking about this the other night because um, I know in your job. You, you, general managers don't operate in the present very often, right? And then sometimes, you know, you see you up in your box watching a game, and I know you're really actually doing a million other things. W right now, are you, can you be in the present watching this? Because it's kind of it's fun. You know, it's, um, I've talked to some other GMs, and I know it's great, and I'm not, I'm weird this way. I just, like, I refuse to allow myself to enjoy any of it um, because it's just the... Uh, Things can change, and you just want to be so locked in on your job and what you're doing. And um, I guess before I became a GM, I was a huge Raptor fan. And not that I'm not a fan, but I just, I've lost my ability to be a sports fan. And I used to just, when I first came to Toronto, I was stayed downtown on Front Street in the condo with my friend. And we'd go buy Sprite Zone seats and go to Raps games and just scream our heads off and complain about the GM and complain about this. <laughs> it was great. We used to argue play NBA Live when we would come home and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, now I just am so caught up in job. I got married, kids. I don't have time, and um, I don't want to get caught up in anything. I just want to be so locked in on the job and what we have, have going on. And maybe 10 years from now I'll regret it, but it's kind of the only way I know how to do it. So. It's funny, you know, sports writers, you know, a lot of guys would say you lose the ability to be a fan as well because you spend too much time. Yeah, around teams in a different way, and you, it's very hard to cheer. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're not supposed to cheer. No cheering in the press we box, right? Che yeah, we cheer. I mean, we the game where Goins hit the home run. Um, Goins hits the home run, and you guys have read about Tony Lacava. You ever met him? Very straight laced, great human being, but very even keel. And um, Goins hits the home home run, right? And there's probably four or five of us. We're going nuts. Yeah! And Tony's sitting there like, I think he threw a cutter, middle. And I, just, and I go, and I grab him and I go, get excited! Get excited! You know, and it was just fun, but we do. But then I'm thinking, man, I hope the cameras did not get me doing this. But there are times when you, you do get excited. Um, there's a lot of other times where I just can't watch and I leave. A few of the walk-offs during uh, the year, the Encarnacion one against the Marlins, and then there was one day or two before. We gave up the lead in the seventh or the eighth. I got so irritated. I left. I just got in my car and drove. The thing I equate going from an assistant GM to a GM is assistant GM, um, you can su suggest and give ideas, but you're never, with, you're never the last line of defense. So you can still go to dinner at night and go to a movie and all that kind of stuff. Hey, that's not my, my call. I'll give my ideas, my suggestions, but... It's not on you to make the decision. I'm not calling GMs. I'm not doing some of those things. But you walk in that clubhouse, the coaches, the players, they look at you. You're like, 
you're the guy to get this fixed. Like, get it fixed. You know, they, they don't say it, but you know when you're walking <laughs> through there, you know, and no one's going to do that to you, but we all see the same, same things. And look, whether it's uh, media and so on. So um, we can't come out and say that. And I, like, I'll never disparage a player in the media. I will always support. If you want to call it lying, fine. Um, but I'm never going to put a player down. You know, I'm always going to look for the positives and so on. And um, you have to do that. I think everyone understands that. It becomes a zoo. If you, you know, the one time I mentioned a fact about Carlos Villanueva hasn't thrown 200 innings but before, it was a zoo. I got crushed. So I had to spend like five hours. I got to pull Carlos in the office. I didn't mean it this way. It got spun. I'm stating the facts. Go pull up your card. Flip the card over. You have to throw 200 innings. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't lie. So, but he was good. But it, it was a story, you know? The tough part is, is that, and I get it, it's sports. Things don't go well. Get rid of the GM. Get rid of the manager. Burn the place down. Get rid of your player. Get it. Fine. Nope. No issue. How did you get from where you were to where you are now? Man, it's a long one. I remember being at Mac, and my dad had passed away, and I came back to school, and I'd worked in his company. When I was going to Mac, I remember people going to job fairs and stuff, and, I, and my dad had a small heating ventilation company, like eight to ten employees, and I didn't have a care in the world. I just going to go work with them. You know, I like sports, like baseball, but I'm not getting a job in sports, you know? So... Um, I was going to work with, my, with my, my dad, and then he passed suddenly, totally un, unexpected. And then I worked in his company. I, he was an engineer, and um, he liked heating and ventilation. I had no interest in that stuff, but I just was aware enough. Uh, so I started working that summer. I had to go back to school. I went back to school, and I realized how much I didn't like what my dad's career was. It wasn't a passion of mine, and it was an eye-opener because everything was real now, right? It was just, I was kind of floating along in life, going to school, hanging out in Greece in the summers. Didn't have a care in the world. So I remember just riding on the bus because this was year three, so I lived in a house, and I'm with my roommate, who's one of my dear friends today, and we're just saying, man, I really want to get into baseball. And I just, I kept talking about it for, he's like, shut up, just do it, man. I'm sick of hearing you talk about it, just do it. I'm like, all right, I think I'm going to try it, you know? And um, I went back home, and then I just, I did the heating ventilation thing, and then I, I woke, woke up one day and just was 23, and I'm like, I just want to do something I love. I don't care about money, I don't have kids. And I just, I just got after it. Like fans come up to me, or people want to talk shop, and I'll give them all the time in the world. They want an hour. I'm, I'm not going to be the guy that you're going to walk away and say, and I don't, I'm not going to swear or anything, but that guy was a jerk, or he didn't give me time, but... I guess by design, I don't want to get caught up in the job, and uh, I'm obsessed about staying who I am, and I'm not trying to be a cheese ball or corny, but I've seen a lot of people, and I, you know, I follow the media, and I think arrogance and sense of entitlement and status, um, you know, Gibby makes fun of me all the time. I drive a Honda CRV. He's like, dude, you're GM. You're driving a Honda CRV. It's a pile of crap, <laughs> you know? And he's like, spend a little money, you cheap, you know? And, um, but I refuse to, if I didn't have this job, I'd drive a Honda CRV, so I'm not going to change. I'm not as passionate about player development. It's not to say I don't enjoy it. I don't think it's important, but I'll defer a lot more on the development side because I didn't, I didn't work in development. You know, I didn't, and I, I'm, scouting is my love. And I always said my, again, GM's great and it's great. So I'm not complaining, but. My dream job, scouting director, to be honest with you. I mean, that's, you want to talk about getting my juices flowing and I get to get on a plane and go to a high school game or a college game. I love it. My question is, is Toronto a difficult sell for free agents, specifically American free agents? Um, mostly because the perception in Toronto is it's a hockey town or moving their families to a foreign country. Um, the immigration when they have to go and play in the States. You know, we've been asked that for years and... Um, I think the unknown, players that don't know, there's some things out, out there that, that are false that could impact it. I remember when we talked to Martin in the off season, I remember telling him, like, if we can't sign you, like, we're, we're toast. Like, you know, if, if we can't recruit you, something's wrong, you know? And um, because you do have to overcome some of those things, the unknown, uh, the fear of the unknown, and you have to find out what makes, makes someone tick and what's important to them. But, you know, I remember I was having this conversation with, I actually asked Josh Donaldson this exact thing. 
um, like two days ago. We're just sitting around after a game talking about all kinds of stuff. And because um, Burley loves the city, loves everything. And we're always looking to make the organization better and more family friendly and player friendly. And the greatest mouthpieces and advertisement we have are our own players. And um, he said, I said, okay, Josh, you've been here a year. Let's say you're a free agent at the end of the year. Put the money aside. Um, now that you know what you know, Toronto is a free agent, you know, and I'm trying to get a sense. I said, what would be the hang-up? Because everyone, I hear it from our players, it's awesome. They love the staff, the city, it's clean, it's safe. Josh said, he goes, the issue is you haven't won. And forget all the other stuff. And um, he said, in my opinion, that's what it is. And now that we're moving in that direction, um, guys are excited to play here. And I, you know, I hear it now through the grapevine of other players. Man, I'd love to come to Toronto. And I think it's, it's not coincidental that, you know, the team's playing better and they're more, more excited about it. So um, I know I sound nuts, but uh, I just I want to stick to the job at hand. We have a ton of work to do. It's a tight race. I want to I get in, you know. I want the banner. Um, I mean, we all want those things. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Barry. For, first of all, I just want to say, I don't think we can thank you enough for what you're doing. This has uh, just changed all our lives, and you're on very much. I appreciate. It. I hope you guys agree. This is kind of great. Um. <laughs> you know what? I don't know. Like, I'm thinking as I'm saying stuff. Like, should I've said that? Should I've said yeah, this? That's, that's like, why it's kind of great. You know, I'm like, <laughs> am I going to get comments tomorrow? Like, that I screwed up. Have another beer. I hope not. <laughs> I hope I didn't say anything dumb. Ah, uh, get out of here, Alex. You did great. That was Alex Anthopoulos recorded live at Pitch Talks in Hamilton. I guess he's kind of a folk hero in that town now, and what would a folk hero be without a song written about him? So here's Zave Ruth with a little bit of his ode to Alex. Uh, so I wrote this song about Alex Anthopoulos about four years ago, um, and... Uh, most of the lyrics still work perfectly because he's amazing and he makes amazing moves. And I'm obviously pretty disappointed that he's not here tonight. Although also a little bit relieved because singing a song about a person who doesn't know there's a song written about them would probably be the most awkward thing that I've ever done. <laughs> so maybe it's, a, maybe it's better that he's not here. Anyway, this is a, the Alex Anthopoulos song. I got my pick in my pocket. For two decades, Toronto's teams have been in disrepair. No Stanley Cup since the 60s, and the Raptors never had a prayer. The Rock are good, sure, but they play lacrosse. And who really cares about the Argonauts? There's the tragedy known as Toronto FC. The Marlies, well, they're just rejected Leafs. Who will come forward and build us a winning team? His name is Alex Anthopoulos. Savior of the metropolis Drafting and trading and getting his wish Dumping bad contracts and speaking Spanish Alex Anthopoulos Working on his shopping list Talking so fast and not sleeping at all He'll bring us October baseball and that's this episode of Pitch Talks. Remember, if you like what you heard or you just want to be a pal, please rate this podcast on iTunes so we can keep this party train rolling. Good or bad feedback, it doesn't matter to us, just write something. And don't forget, you can get info on upcoming Pitch Talks live shows at homestandsports.com, and you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We are at Pitch Talks. Finally, if you want to send me some kudos or budos, you can get me at Kevin H at homestandsports.com. Thanks for tuning in. Good night, everybody. His name is Alex Anthopoulos. The Pitch Talks love theme and today's music by Steve Kreklo at K-R-E-C-K-L-O on Twitter.
Pitch Talks is a production of Homestand Sports. Alex Anthopoulos, appeasing the populace, talking so fast and not speaking.